going through Mark literally verse by verse almost, but uh, we've been reading through it. We just got finished Mark chapter 1. Just to kind of give you a little heads up where we are in the story, Mark chapter 1, uh, Jesus um, is in Capernaum. He's doing all kinds of amazing stuff. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. He heals a leper. And then there's so much attention. He is actually uh, chased out of the city. Really, he goes outside the city because so many people are sort of uh, attached to him. Um, and so we pick up the story here, Mark chapter 1, and we're going to read all of Mark chapter 2. So if you've got a Bible or you have access to a Bible, jump in. I'm going to be reading out of the New King James Version. You can choose your version however you want to do it. But if you see and hear what I'm reading today, you're going to be hearing the New King James Version. And we're going to read through real quickly Mark chapter 2. And then we're going to come back and we're going to focus on a couple of key parts of that. But because we're trying to go through all of Mark, we're going to get through uh, the entire chapter today. Verse number one, and again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. And then then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who carried who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately he rose, took up the bed, went out in the presence of them all, so that they all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Then he taught, then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. And he passed by, and he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. Remember that, because we just talked about that last week. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and the sinners, they said to his disciples, How is that? He eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Verse number 18, The disciples of John of the Pharisees were fasting, and they came to him and said, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse. No one puts new wine in old wineskins, or else new wine bursts the wineskins, and wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. And finally, the last portion here of Mark 2. Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and as they went, his disciples began to pluck his, the heads of grain, and the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is un, not unlawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, How have you read, have you, have you never read that, uh, sorry, have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? He and those with them. He went into the house of God in the days of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and also gave some to those who were with him. And he said to him, 
The Sabbath was made for man and not, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, if you look in your Bible, if you have headings on your scripture, uh, like you have in my version here, I have different headings. There's four main topics that we see in Mark chapter 2. We have the first one where Jesus deals with the paralytic coming through the roof. We have the second one where Jesus is calling Matthew. We have the third one where he is talking about fasting. And the fourth section where he is talking about being Lord of the Sabbath. We're going to take the last two and we're going to put them off to the side today. For time's sake, we're not going to go through them. But we're going to go through the first two in opposite order. Because obviously in Mark's gospel, we talked about the paralytic coming through the roof, being forgiven and healed first, and then Matthew. But we're going to go into Matthew and the story of Matthew here uh, because it has some similarities to where we were um, last time in Mark chapter, uh, in week two, when we were talking about Mark chapter one. Remember in Mark chapter one, we have this scene where Jesus comes to Peter and his brother and John uh, and uh, his brother and has this sort of uh, uh, command, this sort of this sort of uh, a proposal, but also it's this sort of command, follow me. And we remember, I asked you last time, uh, what does it mean to you, the words follow me? What does that mean to you? Now I know for some of you, if I ask you that question, I said this last time, you're going to give me sort of the theological religious rhetoric. Well, to, to follow God is to put Jesus Christ first. And, and you know, the Bible says, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow him. So we know all the right answers, but take all that to aside without using scripture, without using any kind of religious rhetoric. How would you answer the question? What does it mean? The words follow me. Because if you look at these things, there's some aspects in all three stories that we find where this command was given. The first one was with Peter and uh, Andrew when they literally left their nets. They just, they were mending their nets. Jesus showed up and says, hey, follow me. They literally left their net. The, the, the image of that, the, the impact of that, the magnitude of that can't be missed. They did not sell their boat. They did not go and try to make arrangements. They didn't worry. Peter didn't go home and have to figure this out with his wife. He didn't set up, you know, he didn't get everything arranged. He simply heard the commands of Jesus, heard the words of Jesus, and literally left his net. Then, the very next story, James and John are actually on the boat with their dad. And they, uh, they the Bible says that literally they... Um, uh, left the boat with their dad standing on the boat. So we have this sort of precedent that's set here with this immediate response to the call of Jesus Christ. You know, there's so many times where God calls us, but we hesitate or we, we wait. And sometimes that hesitation leads to missing out opportunities that God has. And I asked you this last time, and hopefully you were challenged by this, but I ask you, how would the story would have changed if Peter and Andrew would have hesitated? What would have, ta what would have been different in the, in, the, in, the, in the narrative of the Gospels if even James and John would have said, we're coming, but can you give us some time? So many times I've heard people say, you know, when I get this right, I'll... I'll I'll, I'll get to God. When I can take care of this, I'll get to God. When I, when I can make enough money, I'll get there. And when I, when I can change jobs, when I can change this and change that. And you know what? It never comes to that. Because if God calls you, he calls you from where you are, not from where you will be. Woo! That wasn't in the notes, but you need to grab that because that just went straight over somebody's head. You need to back up and come back and hear that again. God does not call you from where you going to be. He calls you from where you are. If he's calling you today, if the Holy Ghost is pulling from you, God knows every single thing going on in your life. He knows every circumstance. He also knows every difficulty. He also knows every challenge and every responsibility he has. And if he's calling you from where you are, he has a plan for everything and has a solution for every problem. 
But you're not going to see those things until you respond to the calling. We want God to tell us everything, lay it all out, and then we respond. God wants us to respond, and then he'll tell us. Come on, this is life application. Here we go. Ready? We're already into it. Some of you, God is calling you to further places in him. He's calling you to places of, of, of service. He's calling you to places of ministry and giving. But your response is, okay, God, all right, I'll go. But as soon as these things get lined up, God's calling some of you to give of your time and give of your finances. Okay, God, I will. But as soon as I can get a little more time, I'll give you that. Or Scott, I get a little more finances, I'm going to give you that. God says, no, no, no. I'm not calling you from where you're going to be. I'm calling you from where you are. And we don't see this played out any more beautifully than right here in the story of Matthew because Jesus comes and he passes by and he sees Matthew sitting in the tax office. And he walks up to him and he says to him, follow me. And Matthew said, so, okay, well, all right, um, listen, my shift's not over yet. And uh, if I don't finish out my shift, uh, the Romans aren't exactly the easiest people to work with. So listen, I'll take care of this. And, um, and actually, I got to get my two weeks notice. When all that's taken care of, listen, I'll come back and um, I will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll follow you. So uh, where are you going to be in two weeks? Because I'll, I'll, I'll hook up with you then. No, it doesn't say that. It was immediate. Follow me. He literally leaves the tax office. He walks out of the tax office. There was immediate call and response. A yay and amen. I wonder if you look back on some things that when God spoke those things, your hesitation aborted your purpose. I know I'm telling you this right now. I'm saying this because I can look back at some things in my life where my hesitation cost me some things. That my response wasn't immediate. Now you say, well, God's grace is sufficient. And God's forgiving. And yeah, 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 that's the case. But I wonder how this story would have played out if these first five men that we see in the book of Mark, Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew, if their response would have been delayed, would they have been a part of the 12? Or would Jesus have gone off and to find somebody else? Now, I know what we want to hear. Well, of course they would have been. You know, Jesus is kind. He's loving. Of course he would have been. He would have, he would have given them opportunity. He would, have, he would have worked with them. Maybe. But do you want to take that risk? I don't, I don't want to miss out on anything that God has. Even the smallest things. I don't want to miss out. And trust me, I will tell you this. God does not call you in your times of convenience. He will call you during your times of inconvenience. If you want God's calling to be convenient, you have no idea how Jesus works. Jesus does not call you during convenient times. He really calls you during the inconvenient times. For example, right now, it's summer. It's inconvenient. Does he not know? It's been COVID. It's finally starting to open up. We can have normal things in our life. We can go places, do things, get out. We don't have to do these things. If, you know, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. Everything is changing. It's wonderful. It's summertime. I haven't, you know, I get to go on vacation. I get to get outside. God, right now, I need a pause. But what if God right now called you to a place of sacrifice? What if God right now called you to a place of intimacy? What if God called you right now to a further commitment to him? It's not convenient. Summertime. This is not where we are. This is not where we are. We're, we're not in that mode right now. If you're waiting for your life to get convenient so that God can call you, tell me where these callings would have been convenient. He showed up at their job and said, follow me. He called James and John in front of their dad, follow me. He shows up at the tax office and tells Matthew, follow me. 
These are not convenient things. I will tell you this. Mark this down in your book. There is no such thing as convenience when it comes to following Jesus. And what's amazing about this is we want God to be convenient, but life is all about inconvenience. Does your problems ask you, are you, are you tired? Does your hurt and pain ask you in the morning when you wake up, how do you feel today? Does the disappointment and shame and, and pain of your past ask you, are you okay today? Are you doing okay? Oh, good. You're doing okay? Okay, here. Let me unload on you. No, your pain, your problems, your difficulties show up no matter what. If anybody's ever been, ever raised small children, raising children, especially when they're little, is not convenient. Your child doesn't care that you don't feel good. Your child doesn't care you're tired. Your little baby doesn't care that you haven't slept and that you're now delirious and you're drooling in your plate because you can't keep your head up because you haven't slept well in the last three days. That little baby is not saying to you, hey mom, hey dad, if it's convenient to you, would you mind feeding me? Hey mom, hey dad, if it's convenient to you, would you mind changing my diaper? It's not convenient. But we want God to work in convenience. We want God to uh, make it easy for us. But God, you know, it's Saturday. That's, that's my family day. Or God, it's Thursday. Or it's Wednesday. Or God, you know, it's Tuesday. I'm tired. Or God, it's Monday. Everybody hates Mondays. So if you could do something, God, just don't make it on Monday. Oh, God, don't make it on a Friday. Because God, you know, Fridays are tough. They're my, you know, Friday. It's the end of the day. Saturday, God, you know, God, Saturdays. Oh, but Sunday, God, I'll, hey, I'll do anything for you on Sunday, God. I'll give you it all. I'm telling you, the greatest things God will do for you will not be in your times of convenience. It will be in the times of inconvenience. But let's go further. The Bible says, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Look at that. The call and the response, the immediate back and forth. Verse 15, now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house, many of the tax collectors and sinners also sat with, together with Jesus and his disciples, for they were many and they followed him. I love, I love, I love, I love, I love, I love, I love the picture that Mark paints in this passage. I love it. I love the beauty of this picture. You got to imagine, here is Jesus sitting with the worst of the worst. He is sitting with the worst of the worst. He's not sitting with the elite. He's not sitting with the best. We have become so adept to judge things based on circumstances and we have been so adept to judge people even though we claim we don't do this we do it all the time we judge people based off what they look like where they come from where they where they live we i must say this this is who um we judge people because of their lifestyle. Especially, especially, we'll get into this in a minute, especially those of us who consider ourselves so religiously elite, we can't associate with those type people. But here's Jesus, and I love it. Here's Jesus in the middle, right smack in the middle of the worst of the worst. I mean, these guys, these tax collectors were hated. I can't even describe to you, there's nothing in our society today, literally. There's nothing in our society that would equate to the disdain that the Jews had towards the tax collectors. To use the word traitor wouldn't even connotate the disdain that they had for these guys. They were absolutely hated. 
and of all people that Jesus would have associated himself with, or God forbid, talked to, or God forbid, asked to follow him, he chose these characters. What does that tell us about Jesus? What does this picture, all right? Here's the question. What does this picture that Mark paints tell us about Jesus? Think about it for a second. What does this picture paint and tell us about Jesus Christ? Because this beautiful picture that's being painted speaks to something that I believe we have lost when it comes to being Christ-like. I had a story last night, a testimony. I hope it's okay to share it, Shane. I was so impacted by it, I just, I have to share it. So if you and Trish would allow me this morning, um, text me. You can text me and tell me, don't share this story. But if you don't text me in the next 20 seconds, man, I'm telling the story. <laughs> but I was, uh, Shane, uh, Brother Shane Bailey, who's one of our life group leaders, and he and his wife were one of our uh, group leaders, shared a story uh, with me last night. Um, they were living in Hawaii, and uh, I don't remember all the names, and I'm not going to tell the names because it's irrelevant anyways, but uh, uh, I don't remember all the names, but uh, there was a, 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 a musician that played Hawaiian music, a native Hawaiian, and was a uh, was a very skilled musician playing Hawaiian music. Um, uh, somewhere in the process, he wanted to start playing uh, Christian music. I'm not exactly sure the circumstances, forgive me uh, on this. Uh, okay, Shane just said, go ahead. So I'm going ahead, Shane. Thank you for the, for the vote of confidence. So I'm not sure exactly how it all broke down, but basically they, uh, they ask uh, Trish uh, if she could come, Trish, a very skilled musician, great voice, very skilled at playing the piano, uh, has helped here with Antioch West with music and been a part of music here at Antioch for, for uh, many years. So she's very skilled. And so they ask her, would you please come and play, play with us? We need your, we need, you know, we need a, a keyboard. Would you come play with us? We want to play these Christian songs. And they said, but here's the problem. Um, we're going to do it in a studio. You know, it's kind of in the back, kind of in the back of somebody's house. It's a studio. But, you know, basically it's going to be hanging out with a bunch of Bob Marley type guys, right? Smoking marijuana, hanging out, you know, playing some cool music, some Jesus music. Would you be okay with it? She said, you know, sure, I'll come. So she went and, by the way, I will tell you this. Since Trish was not smoking marijuana, in case some of you are wondering, she did not participate in that Dari. So Trish, I saved you on that one. But she's in this atmosphere, right? Surrounded by this group. And I don't know if it was the first session or the second session, but somewhere in there, uh, she shows up and begins to play. And forgive me, Shane and Trish, if I don't get this, but I'm trying to remember the story how you told it. But she begins to play, but all of a sudden she starts weeping. She can't stop weeping. She's crying, and this is in front of all these guys. I mean, this is room full of guys, these Hawaiian dudes. And you've never met guys. The, I mean, Hawaiian guys are the, are, are the coolest guys and the scariest guys and the nicest guys at the same time. Seriously, native Hawaiian guys, because they got that Samoan in them, so most of them look like they could snap you in half. These guys are huge built men. They're the nicest guy, they're the coolest looking guys, but my goodness, they're sometimes the most intimidating looking guys because they look like these Samoan gods. So she's in this room with these guys and she starts crying. And it wasn't the marijuana smoke that was messing with her eyes. She starts crying and she says to the guy, she goes, I'm so sorry, I, I, don't, I can't compose myself. She goes, I, just, I, I can't stop crying. And somehow in the midst of that, she, she turns and there was this, one of the friends or brothers of the guys in the band had come in and he was sitting there and he started weeping. And he's like, I don't know why I'm crying. And right there in the middle of that studio, in that moment, 
with everything going on around, God entered into the studio and God began to touch those lives. And from that one encounter, I believe it was somewhere, although if I don't remember correctly the numbers, it was somewhere well over 10 plus, maybe even higher than that. People came to know Jesus Christ from that one encounter. But it took somebody willing to go into a situation with some tax collectors and sinners and show Jesus Christ. When he shared that story with me last night, knowing what was in Mark chapter 2, I saw this imagery of these two things coming together. I saw the imagery of Jesus Christ looking, sitting in this room full of all these guys that weren't the nicest of people considered to be. But that one action changed the trajectory. And notice this, we don't know their names. We don't know what, where they, what, what, what became of them. But notice this. It tells us here, right here. It says that many tax collectors and sinners sat together with him and his disciples. There were many, not a couple, many, and they followed him. Meaning it wasn't just Matthew that decided to walk with Jesus. Just his simple act of going and sitting and eating with them changed their life. They followed him. You know, we want to we wanna see God do the big things, but the things that can change people lives, people's lives may be found in the small things. It may be eating a meal with them, sharing a moment with them, or sitting in the back of a studio playing a keyboard and just being a reflection of Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus is demonstrating here. So what does that picture of Jesus sitting with those texts, what does that tell us about, what does this show us about Jesus? Because then we see this immediate response. Don't ever question this. I know some of you won't understand what I'm saying, but some of you will. Anytime you start to reflect more of Jesus, make, mark it down. The spirit of religious tradition is going to come after you. Because as soon as Jesus started doing this, guess who shows up? I love this picture, right? I might even get to, we might have to do part two. Because I might not even be able to get to the first part. Because we're in this, Jesus is trying to talk to somebody today. He's, he's wanting us to see something. Notice this. It says, now re, let's read the text so we make sure we, we understand where this is, how these events took place. Now it happened. So he goes to Matthew to the tax office, says, follow me. Matthew starts following him. He leaves the tax office. The very next verse, it says, now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house. So he goes to Levi's house that many tax collectors, many, not a couple, Many, I love it. You show love to one. Everybody that feels the same way now knows I'm, I, there's hope for me. There's hope. All those tax collectors saw the way Jesus responded to Matthew and went, wait a minute. There's hope for me. Maybe God's trying to send you to that one person and that one person will be the key that unlocks a whole village. That one encounter with that man that Trish had that started weeping in that studio, that one encounter, dozens came to know Jesus Christ because of that one. That's why Jesus said one is greater than 99 because that one is not usually all by itself. That one is connected and tethered to others, whether it's through family, relationships, friends, or circumstantial, or relatability of where things are. Matthew wasn't just by himself. Wait a minute, Jesus didn't call everybody. How did they show up? When Jesus called Matthew, a whole group came with him. And he says that many tax collectors and sinners set together with Jesus and his disciples. 
for there were many. I love that. It was so important for Mark to get this across. He used the word many twice in the same verse. He said there were many tax collectors and there were many and they followed him. This is trying to get across to us that this wasn't a small thing. It wasn't Matthew and a couple of buddies. There were enough that Mark used the word many twice here to say it was a, I don't know what, how many many is to you. I think many is more than, it's more than two or three. I would say many is more than two and a, maybe less than a hundred, but anywhere, 20, 30 guys. I would say at least got to be, to me, to use the word many, I would say probably 20 maybe. What would be your definition? I don't know. Let me ask you this. If When you see this word many, how many come to your mind? What does the word many mean to you? Five? I don't know. Would you say five is many? I wouldn't say five is many. Ten? Maybe. But I think you got to get up close to 20 or so at least before you start using the word many. But watch this. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collector and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with the tax collectors and sinners? Notice this. Oh, you got to get this. You got to get it. I don't know how I got so deep into this today, but Lord, I'm just submitting this to you. Who is in Matthew's house? I'm going to give you a second. little Jeopardy music. To think about that answer, who is in Matthew's house? Right? In Matthew's house, you had Jesus and Matthew. You had the disciples that he had at the time, which we know there was at least four. And then you had the group of tax collectors and sinners. Right? That's who's in the house. And they're eating together. But who shows up? The Pharisees and the scribes. Were they in there? No. So what does that mean? That means that they showed up looking to call something into question. They showed up. They were nosy. It's amazing how many critics start to show up when you start doing things that look a lot like Jesus. Mm. I'm just going to let that simmer for a second. Psst. It's amazing, man. The more you try to be like Jesus, the more people have an opinion. I got this to tell you today. Forgive me for a moment to be so bold. Can I be honest with you? I don't care what your opinion of me is. I want to be like Jesus. And these dudes showed up and were peeking in the door and the window and looking around going, hey, psst. Listen, why, why is he in this house? Does he not know who he's hanging out with? That's exactly what happened. And Jesus heard it. What? I love this. This story is so awesome to me. I love it. Get it. Jesus is eating with Matthew and a group of tax collectors and sinners. And there were many, so the house had to be full. And a group of Pharisees show up and try to talk to his disciples, and Jesus heard it. I'm not going to be able to get in today. I'm going to run short on time. But I want you to see the contrast between these two stories. In the first one, of the man who was let down through the roof. And we have to come back and talk about this because there's some things I want to get into with this. 
But in the first story, we have the Pharisees and the scribes in the house. We have a house full because when Jesus, when they were let down, it was the Bible. Go, go here, verse number six. Because verse number six says it was the scribes who reasoned in their heart says, how does this man forgive sins? So get the picture. In the first story, we have Jesus in a room, in a house so filled that you couldn't get in it. The only way you could get in it was someone had to be let through the roof. When the man was let through the roof, the scribes sitting there, when Jesus forgave him of his sins, they started talking back and forth. So the first house was filled with scribes. The second house was filled with sinners. Let me ask you this. Which house do you want to be hanging out in? Ooh! Because I love it. Look who was on the outside of the house. The first house, you had the needy on the outside and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the religious on the inside. In the second house, it was the hurting and the needy on the inside and the religious were on the outside. And trust me, the religious did not like the fact that they were stuck on the outside looking in. Woo, if I could get up and run around this table, I would. Somebody needs to get that. Who was in the house? I've preached on it. I've heard of it, right? The verse of Mark chapter 2 starts off with says, it was heard that Jesus was in the house. Go back and read it, right? Mark chapter 2, verse 1, it says, and he again entered in Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Well, let's take the fact that Jesus was in the house. Who was in the house with Jesus? First one. We have a bunch of scribes hanging out with Jesus, and the needy couldn't even get in. The only way the needy could get in, they had to come through the roof. They had to make a new way. They had to, they had to bypass the religious to get to see Jesus. But the second house, mm, I'm telling you what, I could jump up right now, run around this table. In the second house, it was filled with the needy and the hurting and the religious were on the outside and the religious didn't like the fact that they couldn't get in the house. But Jesus was in a house filled with hurting and needy. And watch the difference in the fruit. In the first house, one guy was changed. In the second house, many were changed. My God, my God, my God, my God, my God, I feel the spirit of revelation. Somebody needs to hear what I'm saying. I may be just talking to myself today. That's okay. Forgive me for a moment. Let me have a little time with Jesus. Somebody needs to hear what I'm saying. As long as the church is filled with the religious, the only hope we have is every once in a while, somebody's going to sneak through the roof. But if we could get a church Filled with some tax collectors and a sinner. I'm not talking about the physical church. I'm talking about the attitude of the church. If we can get a house filled with saints, I mean with, with tax collectors and sinners, many, many, many will find Jesus. That means if you're religious, there's no room in God's house for you. My God, my God, my God. Look at the difference in those two stories. I've never seen this before in my life. Honest to God, I've got no notes. If you look on here, all you can see is verses. I'm not telling you something because I've studied this out and looked at it. I'm literally sitting here right now and I'm blown away. I've never seen this. Maybe you have. And thank you for letting me catch up to where you are. But I've never seen this in my entire life. Look at the difference in the two houses. One house was filled with a bunch of religious people that were so caught up in following and looking at Jesus that they forgot the needs around them to the fact that a guy was hurting a guy was broken and the only way he could get to Jesus was to create we've made it so hard for people to get to Jesus my God my God my God my God I know some of you have no idea what I'm talking about and that's okay come back next time it'll be something for you but some of you know exactly what I'm talking about hear me Antioch West hear me Antioch West hear me Antioch West this is what Jesus is trying to get across to Antioch West I'm telling you right now in the Holy Ghost I'm speaking a word into Antioch West this morning here's the problem we've made it so hard for the people that need Jesus to get to Jesus because we who are healed have gotten of the 
prime seating and we don't even know that there's hurting because we're so tunnel focused on what we can get from Jesus today. What can you give me today, Jesus? What can you what can you put in my spirit today, Jesus? That there are people that are hurting that we can't even make room and that the only way they can get to Jesus, they've got to create holes in the ceiling. But in the second house, Jesus said, I'm going to show you who I hang out with. In the second house, he had a room filled with sinners and tax collectors. And guess who were the people on the outside of that house? It was the Pharisees and scribes. And they did not like the fact they were on the outside looking in. You would think they'd be like, look at this. These guys are finding Jesus. This is awesome. But yet they were nitpicking at the fact that Jesus was in the house filled with these guys. Oh, 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 what has happened to the church? The Bible says that all of heaven rejoice when one sinner finds forgiveness and repentance. But the church has turned a blind eye to them because the church is so focused and we've justified it. We're serving God. We're doing everything we can to please God that we've forgotten the purpose of Jesus Christ. And look at the fruit that came from these encounters. First encounter, one guy followed Christ. In the second, many, because it determined who was in the house. And when they called Jesus into question, the Bible says Jesus heard it and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Let me ask you this question. Why does the church exist? Why does the church exist? What's the purpose of the church? Why does it exist? We want, we've stopped wanting the church to be a hospital for the hurting. We want it to be a resort for the saints. If I went to a resort today, wherever it would be, there's expectations I would have because I was at a resort. So I want my needs taken care of. I want convenience. I want ease. I, I, I want there to be something you know, there are certain resorts you can go to that it's all inclusive in the package. You pay a certain fee, everything, food, all of it's included. And when you go to a resort, there's an attitude that's built into that. If you've ever been to a resort, that there's expectation that I'm going there to be served, to be pampered, to be convenient. If I go to a resort, I'm not going there to work. I'm not going there. To sacrifice, I'm going there because there's expectation. Because a resort, it's all about me. I'm not trying to be negative. If I'm going to a resort, it's all about me. And you better make it about me. And the resorts that do the best job are the ones that make it about you. Sir, can I help you with those bags? Yes, you can. Sure, yes. Sir, can I take your luggage to your room? Yes. Sir, what can I get you? Would you like something to drink? Sure, yes. Sure, where would you like to go? Can we help you get that? What, what can we do for you? I mean, when you're in a resort, you don't even have to clean your own room, right? Do you have housekeeping? Come up. You don't even have to make your own bed. You don't have to take out your own trash. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to leave your room. Room service? Yes. Can I get a cheeseburger? Yes, sir. We'll be up in just a minute. It's built for your convenience. We've made a church, the resort for saints. Because God, you know it's hard, man. You know, like we go to a resort, right? You go to a vacation because you work hard. You work hard. You give, you sacrifice, and then you get those that vacation. And when you go on vacation, you don't want to go on vacation at work. You want to go on vacation to relax. 
and you go with expectation, I'm tired, I work hard. So I should deserve some level of relaxation, some level of, of being taken care of. We've turned church into a resort. God, you know, I've worked hard all week. I've been out there in the real world, God. I've been working hard for you. I've been showing you, God, all the stuff I can do. I've been standing. I've been holding the banner in the old song, hold up the banner for Christ. I've been holding up the banner for you, God. I've been out there. And you know, Lord, it's tough out there. There's so much stuff in this world that's pushing against me. But God, I just want to let you know I held the line. So God, I'm coming to the resort today because I could really use some pampering. I could really use some encouragement. I could really use a, 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 a sit by the pool today, have my feet soak and just and just enjoy some relaxation lord i i could use a cabana today god because you know i don't even want to sit in the sun i just want to sit on my little chair in my cabana and just hear the hear the splashing of the pool oh god you know i i i, I, I don't even want to make my bed today god could you send housekeeping up to clean up my room and to get my bed together god because you know i've been working all week but jesus said those who are well have no need for a physician God's trying to build a hospital and we're trying to make a resort. Look at it. I'm not knocking it. But look at some of the ways churches are built nowadays, man. They are so built. I mean, my goodness. All of you from, Annie, you know what it's like. Those of you at York West, we sat on metal folding chairs at Crofton for three years. Some of you, it hurt so bad when you left, your butt was flat. Carrying in your cushion because it hurt your back. But man, I know I've been to some churches. Honestly, when you sat down, I mean, there was a couple of churches I've been to. They got theater seats. I'm not knocking them. If you got it, hey, God bless you. But I've been to some churches, man. They got theater seats. And when you sit down in those theater seats and they're like special, like four inch foam. I think it's like memory foam. It just kind of cradles, cradles your backside. And it's got great lumbar support. And honestly, I've sat in some churches with some theater seats. And to be frank with you, I didn't feel like worshiping too much because it felt too good to sit. Honestly, I just praised Jesus from my seat because honestly, it felt good. Because it was just nice. I don't know if that's what God intended. This statement here kind of makes me think, mm, and the context by which he's telling this statement makes me think we've missed something. Can you imagine, just for a moment, and I'm almost done, we're gonna have to come back and do part two of this, because I didn't get a chance to get to all of it, and the Lord knows, following Jesus. Can you imagine today, if you're sick, and you needed medical assistance, and you went to the hospital and you walked into the emergency room. They said, what can we do for you? And they, you said, I'm sick. You know, I'm having chest problems, whatever it might be. Can you imagine if they looked at you and said, well, sorry, sir. Um, this is only for well people. Um, if you're sick, we really can't help you. What would you do? What would happen if the place that you thought was supposed to be the place to help is a place that turns you away because you're actually in need of help? You know the policy, 7-Eleven has it, no shirt, no shoes, no service. The church has adopted that mentality. No shirt, no shoes, no service. We are so, we become so narrow-minded that people have to get cleaned up to come to God to get cleaned up. Oh man, I'm on it today, man. Jesus is on it, I'm just following Jesus and I'm shooting thing out there, I know I can feel it stinging. We've made it so hard that people actually have to get cleaned up to come to God to get cleaned up. We've made it so hard that the sick have to get healthy to come to the hospital 
to get healthy. Hmm? Whoa, time out. The church is a place where people can find Jesus. But yet we've made it where people have to get whole to come to church to get whole. But yet, when we were in the pit, we just needed something. And we were so thankful that we could find somewhere for God to pull us out of our pit. But now that we're out of our pit, and God has filled in that pit with his love and forgiveness, now we want to turn around and expect somebody to climb out of their pit instead of us going down into the pit with them. What does the church exist for? Two questions today, and I didn't get any further to this. This is the thing I should probably start preaching with notes. This is the danger of not preaching with notes. Two questions today. What does the picture of Jesus sitting with the tax collectors in a sinner, what does that tell us about Jesus? And secondly, what's the purpose of the church? Because if the church is the body of Christ, then the purpose of the church should align with the, with the head, which is Christ. So the church and Christ should have the same purpose. And Christ said, I have not come I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. How can you separate the purpose of that? The church has lost its purpose. The church has lost its true purpose. We've made church about trying to make whole people wholer. That's not even a word, but it sounds good today. And we've changed the hospital into a resort. We've shut down the hospital. We've turned it into a resort. And we got people showing up to the hospital who are sick, but we say, you know what? There's not here. Go home and get well and then come back and we'll accept you. Wait a minute. If you are sick, you need help. If you are sick, you can't heal yourself. We got hospitals today. You can show up to. And what would it be like to be turned away because you were sick? Sorry, sir, you can't come in today. This is only for sick, for well people. In my kid's doctor's office, their pedi the, uh, pediatric uh, office they go to, in the waiting room, there's two sections. There's a section for sick visits and a section for well visits. If you're well, you can sit there. If you're sick, you sit here. They separate the two. We've done the same thing. Except for us, it's not in the waiting room. The well people get the prime seats with Jesus in the house. The sick people, they're on the outside. And if they want Jesus bad enough, they'll create a hole through the roof and we'll sit there and go, wow, isn't this cool? Look at that, they got to Jesus. When really the indictment of that situation is not the fact that these people, this guy had faith to come through the roof. It's an indictment that the people sitting around Jesus were so stinking narrow-minded that they couldn't see the need that was standing right behind them. Why do we even exist? Well, it's about me growing in Christ and learning about Christ. Yeah, really? Okay. But if that's the case, I got about 400 scriptures we need to take out of the Bible. Why do we even exist? What's the church exist for? This world is filled with sick. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. This is his church. He's building his church. And what does his church look like? His church looks more like a hospital than it does a resort. There are no umbrella drinks. There's no five-star service. There's no morning breakfast buffets. His church 
looks like a place that people can run to who need help. Notice the Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower that the righteous run into and are saved. The righteous are supposed to run to him, but the hurting are supposed to run to the church. Mm. I need a microphone. I need, a, I need something here. I got an eraser that's propping up my iPad. Doesn't have the same effect if I drop it. The righteous are to run to Jesus. But where are the sinners supposed to run to? They're supposed to run to the church because the church is supposed to be the reflection of Christ. But we're so busy at his feet trying to get ours that we forget there's people around us that are hurting that the only way to get them, they got to come through the roof. What should have happened that day is everyone should have said, hey, listen, make room. There's a guy here who really needs help. I'm okay. I can walk. I have, I can, I have feeling in my legs. I'm, I'm healed. This guy needs healing. Let's let him get up next to Jesus because he's the healer. But no, I got to get mine. I got, in basketball, they call it boxing out. When you get between your, you and the, your, the baskets here and the defenders there and the ball shot, you want to get between. You want to box out the defender. So if the ball jumps, you can get it. We're boxing out people. No, no, no. Don't. No, no, no. Jesus is pouring out blessings. You better get back, brother, because I'm going to get my breakthrough today. What if you don't need a breakthrough, but the person behind you is the one that needs a breakthrough? Are you willing to get out of the way and say, God, if I stay the way I am, I'm okay with that because they need you. Your breakthrough is because you can't discipline their, your flesh. Their breakthrough is because their soul needs saving. God help us. I'm so tired of saints who need a breakthrough because they can't deny themselves. They can't discipline their flesh, so they got their lives in a mess, but they want God to give them a breakthrough, and they're boxing out people that are lost who need forgiving and need saving, but they can't get to Jesus because I got to get mine. I rebuke that spirit in Jesus' name. I curse it in Jesus' name. There's no place in God's house for that attitude. What does the church exist for? What does it exist for? We have to answer that question, and we got to be that. I'm not. Those who are well don't need a physician. I haven't called, come to call the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. What are we here for? What are we doing? What are you doing? Are you so caught up in trying to get yours? that you forgot the hurting that are around you? What does this part of Mark tell us about Jesus? Lord, only you know that everything that came out of me today was from you. Every single thing that I've shared today, Lord, was from you. I've not tried to add to or take from. So Lord, I put all these things that were said today in your hands. I speak that the attitude and the spirit by which I say them would be received in the way they were spoken. But Father, I speak now in Jesus' name that you would show us who you are and show us what you're about. I rebuke the blindness of religious tradition. I rebuke the blindness of the spirit of religious tradition off of us, and that we could open our eyes and see today, Father. Open our eyes today. Open our eyes today that we can see. In Jesus' name, I place all of this in your hands. I lay all this at your feet. Father, we need you now more than ever. Show us who you are. Show us how to walk in you. God, if there's things about us that we that are in error, reveal to us those things that we can change to become more like you in everything we do. I speak all these things in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Come back, be with us next week, July 4th. Special broadcast. 
July the 4th, and then we're going to pick up Mark again the following week. Probably going to come back and finish this. This is some good stuff we missed in the first story. We're going to come back and look at that, then we'll move along. We're just following Jesus. You know, we might stay in Mark for the rest of the year. Who knows? We're just going to take it one by one with Jesus. We're following him every step we take because he's the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith. God bless you as always. Have a safe week. See you on Tuesday for Tuesday Talks. Digging Deeper, brand new, coming to you this week. We're going to be talking about the day of Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost. You're going to want to see that. Both of those videos will be coming to you this week on YouTube. You're going to want to pay attention. And then we'll see you again next Sunday at 10 a.m. As always, God bless you. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again next time.